day, you'll see the longest competitive closed course race featuring the world's best NASCAR Grand National Drivers. Your at World 600 is brought to you by the Stroh Brewery Company. Family brewed quality for 200 yeah. brewers of Stroh's, Old Milwaukee, and other fine beers. By Skull Bandit, the tobacco play without lighting up. It's a pouch instead of a puff. And by Bodyguard, the premium car wax from Simon Eyes. A long-lasting finish that goes on easy. And by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? Welcome to the Silver Anniversary celebration of one of America's most storied speedways, the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Daytona, Talladega, and Darlington, their sprint races compared to this, the longest stop on the Grand National Stock Car Tour, the World 600. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Joy. Today, Neil Bonnet will have a chance to do what no man could put together in 24 years, three consecutive wins in the World 600. A man who had a flirtation with such a streak is my co-host today. Donnie Allison won two races here, and out of a consecutive five, finished second in the other three. That's quite a record, but Neil will have a tough road to go today. Well, Mike, you know, the way I see it, uh, Neil's going to have an exceptionally tough road on account of the competition so keen. You know, it, uh, if you're off a little bit now, you're not back to second or third like when, when I won the race here, but uh, you're back to 10th or 15th. And uh, so Neil's going to have a rough road to, to win those three in a row. Another major story, the king of stock car racing, Richard Petty could nail down his 200th career Winston Cup victory here today. In the all-time list, his next closest pursuer, David Pearson, has 105 career wins. And who would imagine 10 years ago that anyone would ever win 200 races on this tough circuit? Well, I don't know who they might be, Mike. You know, it's definitely not me, but, uh, you know, Richard's got an excellent chance to do it today on account of the racetrack is uh, slick, and, and the car's got to handle well, and he's always been known to have a car that had a good chassis, handle well, and... Uh, I think he's got a little better shot at, at winning 200 than Neil does three in a row. Now, this race is set to go 600 miles, but there is a threat of rain in the forecast for later this afternoon. And if it comes, the race could be called official any time after the halfway point, and that'll make quite a change in race strategy. Well, I, I think so very definitely, Mike. You know, when uh, the rain is threatening, you've got to go to the front. You've got to try to stay there. You've got you to organize your pit stops around that, and uh, it causes quite a problem because, you know, any time after halfway, it can be called a race. And, uh, you know, you can't sit there fourth or fifth and, and be hoping at the end you, you got a shot at winning and you got to go to the front. We're looking for a really competitive race this afternoon. Let's go down to Pitt Road and Charlie Harville. There's a carnival atmosphere here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway, but it all stems from the greatness of the Silver Anniversary World 600. Many of us remember the first race 25 years ago. Qualifying situation here at Charlotte created some interesting alignments. On the first day, Keo Yarborough was fastest, but on the second day, after rain following pole position qualifying, his car was relegated to 14th spot in the starting order. Joe Rutman qualified with the sixth fastest speed overall, but he qualified on the third day. He'll be starting 31st. On the front row, Harry Gant in his number 33, Skull Bandit. And on the outside of the front row, a former World 600 winner, Benny Parsons in his number 55 Copenhagen car. They'll get the World 600 underway as they lead the field of 42 cars down Pitt Road in just a minute. The crowd filing into the Charlotte Motor Speedway as we look at the STP starting grid. On the pole, 162 and a half miles an hour, the Bandit, Harry Gann. In the Burt Reynolds and Hal Needham, Skull Bandit, Chevrolet, prepared by Travis Carter. On the outside pole, his teammate, Benny Parsons. The Leo Jackson engineered Copenhagen Chevrolet at 162.2 miles per hour. Row number two, the former rookie of the year, Jody Ridley. The Cumberland Carpet Mills Chevrolet at 161.9. Starting fourth, the two-time national champion, Darrell Waltrip of Franklin, Tennessee. In the Junior Johnson Budweiser Chevrolet. Fifth on the grid, NASCAR's all-time super speedway winner, the Silver Fox, David Pearson, the Chattanooga Jew Chevrolet. The first four to the field will go in sixth position. The Wood Brothers, Valvoline Ford, for Buddy Baker at 161 and a half. Seventh, Bill Elliott, the Winston Western 500 winner in the Coors Melling Ford Thunderbird. Starting eighth, 
the FTP Pontiac for the king of stock car racing. The sport's all-time winner, Richard Petty. Winner last week at Dover, searching career victory number 200 this afternoon. Those are the front four rows of the 42 car field. Here's the way the rest of the grid lines up for the Silver Anniversary World 600. Row five, Neil Bonnet trying to win his third straight. And the Richmond winner, Ricky Rudd. Terry Labonte with Rusty Wallace in row number six. Row seven, Jeff Bodine and Cale Yarborough. Row eight, Tommy Ellis and Bobby Allison. The ninth row, Lake Speed and Ron Bouchard from Massachusetts. In 10, Dale Earnhardt and Phil Parsons. Tim Richmond with Dave Marcus, Pontiac in the 11th row. Jim Sauter and Dick Brooks. Trevor Boyce, the Canadian, and Frank Sachs. Sterling Marlin and Bobby Hillen Jr. Dean Combs and the short track champion Mike Alexander. Rutman and Reagan. Shepard and Heveron. Dwyer and Coward. Harrington and Randy Baker. Jimmy Means, Connie Taylor, Kyle Petty, and Tommy Gale. Stay tuned for the start of the World 600. Here on the racetrack, let's check in with Dick Brooks in the 90 car. Can you talk to us, Dick? I've got a description of the race, and uh, uh, they tell me I can't talk during the race. I have to do it under the caution, so uh, that's caution. We'll be coming back to you, I expect. So uh, this is Dick Brooks, the comedian number 90, Ford Thunderbird, show up on a speedway for the World 600. Donnie, I don't think you want to be talking to us when you're trying to get that car around the racetrack 160 miles an hour. Like I really don't either, especially on a mile and a half. Now, you might get away with a little bit of Daytona Talladega when I'm here in Charlotte. They're coming out of turn number four, the Ford Turbo Thunderbird safety car heads for pit road. We're looking for the green flag to start the Silver Anniversary World 600. Green is on as they come past the flag stand into that little dog like turn and head for turn one, and they are still two by two. Walter makes the move to the inside from the second row. And drops in line between Gann and Parsons. That's Harry Gann out front with the lead, and Betty Parsons quickly fades back in the field. Yes, evidently something, something bad has gone wrong there, uh, Mike, or he wouldn't have fell off that fast. Field down the back straightaway. Rounding turn number four to complete the first. Of 400 laps. Gans and Bolton are out front. Walter in second. Buddy Baker has picked up the third spot. Jody Ridley is fourth. And the pair of Chevrolets have started first and fourth. Running away from the field, and here goes Walter. He's wasting no time asserting himself. Putting his junior Johnson from their car right on the bottom of the racetrack. He swings just up high a bit off of turn four. And Walter will lead the second lap. Walter's the point leader in the NASCAR with Cup standing. And it's worth five points to lead a lap, any lap of this race. Walter wanted to get those five bonus points in a hurry. Field fans out behind the two Chevrolets and the four. Richard Penny has moved from eight starting spot into fourth. Petty, top of your screen, right behind Buddy Baker's four. Darrell Walter trying to jump out ahead of the field, and here again staying right with him. Then Baker's four, Petty Pontiac. We talked with Richard Petty earlier in the World 600 Week and asked him just what a way victories, how do you approach that magic mark? Well, the big deal is that it's the next race that I got to win, whether it's 150 or 200 or whatever, and it just happens to be 200, and we're interested in winning the next race. So if it happens to be 200, then that's what we're interested in. So it's uh, it's just a number as far as that's concerned. It's just a bigger number than anything else. And uh, right now, I'd really like to go ahead and win 200 and get it over with, so we're going to do it. Stretch once again, Darrell Waltram. Waltram has 60 Winston Cup victories over his career and two consecutive national championships. Driving for Junior Johnson out of Verona, North Carolina. Junior, the holder of 50 Grand National Checkered Flag. And he's opening up quite a distance on Harry Gann. I, I guarantee you, Mike, his car seems to be handling extremely well. And, you know, the racetrack is slick, even though there is a cloud overcast. Right now, Darrell is really showing a way to go. Walter, the leader, again in second. Petty dueling with Baker. 
Parker for third. There is Benny Parsons' car. Parsons, the outside pole sitter, was slow on the start, did not get away with the pack, and now he is limping around the racetrack. Petty has taken third. Two Chevrolets, a Pontiac and a Ford, and the 42-car field in the World 600. Baker trying to get underneath Richard Petty, trying to retake the third spot, and drops back in line. Car length of advantage on Buddy Baker's fourth place machine. And Baker takes it right back in the corners. Here comes Baker on the bottom of the racetrack. Out of turn four, Waltrip uncontested in the front of the field. Can't solidly in second. There's the race behind them for third. And Baker's car is working well down low. You know, it surprises me, Mike. You did another way around. You know, they outrun Penny up the away and uh, he outruns them in the corner, but just the opposite today. They are three wide for the third spot. And on the bottom of the racetrack, Terry Labonte will get it. Here's Benny Parsons on pit road. Third place now belongs to Terry Labonte. And Neil Bonnet wrestles with Richard Penny for the fourth position. Baker has dropped back to six. Underneath Bobby Allison. Neil Bonnet's car, consecutively numbered from Waltrips. They're 11 and 12. Same paint scheme, same sponsor. All different racing team. Cars prepared right next door to one another at Junior Johnson and Warner Hodgson's shop. And they're two completely different crews. The hood is up on Parsons' car, and that's not a good sign, certainly not this early in the race. No, it's not. I really don't understand that, Mike, because I, know, I understand him running slow like he was doing. He was looking for a caution flag, but uh, no caution came out, so he, he went ahead and he had to lose that one lap, hoping that maybe if a caution come out, he could get in the pits and get whatever was wrong fix to get right back out, but it didn't work out that way. Betty Parsons, a winner at Atlanta, will not be a winner here. Darrell Walter leads the World 600 looking for his 61st career Grand National victory and his fourth win of the season. Look at the margin that Walter was opened up on Harry Gant. And behind them, the battle rages on from third spot on back. There's Neil Bonnet. He has moved underneath Gant. And Bonnet picks up a position. That'll place him third behind Walter and Terry Labonte in the Piedmont Airlines car. Harry Gant will be fourth. Bobby Allison has moved up to fifth as Petty's car goes to the top of the racetrack. He's in danger of losing a sixth spot to Buddy Baker. Darrell Walter out in front of the pack. There's Terry Labonte in second. Bonnet in third and fourth place side by side. Allison is underneath Gant. that surprise you? No, not really. It doesn't, Mike. Uh, he's enjoying that little bit of a lead right now, but, you know, and not to be facetious or anything like that, but, you know, Bobby Allison started 16th, and he's already fourth or fifth, and, and I'll tell you what, uh, his car is handling extremely well, and might be that the sports race gives these two guys a little advantage. You know, they do what they expect in the racetrack, and are able to adjust their car to it. Allison has moved up to the fourth position. Two cars have really marched through the pack. Bobby Allison is one. And the other is young Kyle Petty, who started back in the 41st spot. Next to last, he's now running in midfield. The five car is doing the modified H. Jeff Bodine, a winner at Martinsville. He's working on the low side of Richard Petty. Right behind him, Dale Earnhardt. And another Yankee chauffeur, Ron Bouchard. Petty and Bodine get close, coming through the trioval. Down into the corner. Leading Allison there from third spot, and a gaggle of cars fighting for the fifth position. Petty works the high side of 09 as we continue under the green in the World 600. That's the front five. A lot of hard nose racing back in the field as we're watching the battle for the lead. Labonte has caught Walter and wants to get by. Cutting across the grass almost down to turn number one. Low side of the racetrack, and that will be to his advantage. Well, right now, you know, 
I think the racetrack has gotten a lot slicker, and uh, you know, I saw Darrell slip a lot in the upper lane, and Terry D get the bottom, and evidently that's the fastest way to go because he's in the front now. Where is the best place to pass? Here? Well, I always uh, preferred one and two myself. You know, the uh, first, second turn was a little bit drier, so to speak, than third and fourth turn. You put a little bit more in three and four. I always like one or two, but I know like guys like Buddy Baker, they like to pass the three or four, so it's just a matter of preference, I guess. Good battle going on behind the leader. Neil Bonnet caught up in that high groove, and you can see it's not working for him. Jeff Bodine in the five car, Dale Earnhardt, and there's Ron Bouchard in 47. The Buick all getting underneath Neil Bonnet. He looks like a lonely man up there on the high side. Well, I know, uh, you know, he's stuck on the outside right now. Like I said, Mike, it's, it's awful slick up there, evidently, because every car that goes in and in the bottom goes by, and uh, the guy that gets stuck on the outside, he is slipping and sliding. Link Speed in the number one car, the Bull Frog Next Machine. He's trying to work his way past Bonnet. And Neil will have to find a hole and get in line to run on the bottom of the racetrack. Here's the lead pack, Labonte, Allison, Waltrip. The rest of the field coming mostly single file. A little dust kicked up there near the outside retaining wall. Kyle Petty trying to move up in the board there. He's climbed up from the tail end up to the middle of the pack. I'll tell you what, Jim, Mike, he's doing a super job. His car is handling fairly well and running real good. And Kyle right now is really impressed with me. Terry Labonte looking for his first win at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. One elsewhere on the tour, but not here. Jeff Bodine battling with Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt is a Wrangler car number three. Started in 19th position. He has moved up to fifth. And looks to the back buffer of fourth place Bodine. Ron Bouchard right with them. The yellow car at the top of your screen. At the front of the field, Labonte. He's got his seat on the Texas short track. Yarbrough and Richard Petty side by side there. That's back about 10 spots. And Bobby has the inside and he wants to run in the lead. Alice Buick slips underneath the Terry Labonte car and into the front spot. And right now, Mike, he can stay about a half a width of a car lower than anybody else in the corner. And that's the reason why he's leading the race, I believe. It's uh, his car just seems like it's stuck a little bit better than, than most. And, uh, of course, Richard Petty noted to have a good chance. He seems to be having an awful lot of trouble right now. He's just going back further and further. And uh, if he's not careful, his son's going to catch him in a little bit. Petty's up on the top of the racetrack. Here now, the fight for second spot. Waltrip on the outside of Labonte. And Darrell's car looks to be working a little better up on the high side. Well, you know, one lap he, he runs really good up there, and then the next lap he evidently gets out of that little bitty groove, and, and they must have cut up there. And uh, you know, I noticed Earnhardt's car a while ago was doing the same thing, handling a little bit better in the top lane. But, uh, you know, it, it, the racetrack's awfully slick right now, Mike. A lot of jostling in midfield. Here come the leaders. Down into the corner, two by two. That track looks awfully bumpy at 160 miles an hour. Yes, it is, and uh, I think uh, as fast these cars are going right now, and that little traffic jam right there, uh, you, don't, you don't want to hit too many bumps. Field moves past the Delma Coward Automobile. Bobby Allison looking for career victory number 81. Let's go to his pit. With Gary Nelson, crew chief of the number 22, Bobby Allison car. Is it going according to plan, Gary? when there's not many cautions and we're running this good because the other guys don't really have much time to adjust their cars. We've been, we started off a little loose and then we got it to where it was pushing a little. We just made an adjustment and uh, we hope it really get, comes on now for the rest of the race. It started out loose and now it's pushing. What's that mean? Well, really, I think uh, everybody anticipated how sick the race that was going to be and I don't think they anticipated it will be as sick as it really is. So he started the car with the car a little bit loose and on the pit stop quickly again. Now they're pushing. 
Curtis Turner said once, loose is when you hit the wall with the back end of the car. Push is when you hit the wall with the front end of the car. Well, that, that's a pretty good determination of it. Uh, I never like to go quite that far, Mike. <laughs> Bobby Allison leads the World 600. And here's Patty on pit road. This is unexpected. And that hood going up is a grim sign. Trouble up in the corner. One car spins to the bottom of the racetrack. Well, Mike had Trevor Boys, and he and Terry Levani got together. And Terry made a little bit on further around the racetrack, but uh, those cars look now like they're going pretty good. Lake Speed also involved in that one. There is Trevor Boys, the Canadian driver's car, and Terry Levani's Piedmont Airlines machine has gotten to the end of pit road, and now it will lift down the pit lane, dropping the window net for Trevor Boys and James Hilton car, a wave that he's okay. Can't say the same for that car. No, Mike, they hit pretty hard, and uh, I was really surprised that Terry got his car back moving again. Ricky Rutt's on pit road. The talented 28-year-old driver, the Budmore Ford. Here's Terry Gant, the bull sitter. Travis Carter and the crew. Dale Earnhardt, Richard Childress, Kurt Shelbertine and the Ranker crew, spinning right side tires. And here's Phil Parsons, the outside pole sitter's younger brother, one of the Rookie of the Year candidates. He'll take on right side tires as well. The field will bunch up for the restart, and we'll be back to Charlotte Motor Speedway. 600, we're just past halfway. Bobby Allison, the sixth different leader in this race. And we've just had the first caution flag of the day. We went the first half of the race. Caution three. Kinder drops the green flag for the restart and they come digging past the start finish line three abreast that is Earnhardt way up on the outside Harry Gant trying to get back on the lead lap on the low side of the racetrack and Bobby Allison works ahead into the lead Allison takes the high groove Earnhardt slams down low and that's Tommy Ellis way down below the yellow line there you know the sports driver from West Virginia Ellis, middle of the pack, a couple laps off the pace. Front of the field, Allison and Earnhardt. The third car in line is Harry Gant. He is one lap behind, trying to pass the leader, get back on the lead lap. And Gant almost takes it into the grass. Well, you know, now, uh, really, Mike, they've got a chance to change all four tires on their pit stop on the yellow. And uh, it's very important. The tire compound is so hard, a lot harder than they thought it should be because of the sealer, you know. But Peter's like paint. It's starting to roll up and coming off the surface and uh, making the car slide more and more with the hard tires. And that's the reason why you see a car going in the bottom and end up in the top. Kale Yarborough working Ricky Rudd. And Neil Bonnet, race traffic. There's Peter Allison. And Allison now has a cushion between himself and the second place car. Harry Gann at 33 has settled in between the two leaders. The front cars came from way back in the pack on the start. Allison started 16th. Earnhardt in the number three car started 19th. That just shows, Donnie, where you qualify has little bearing on where you end up running once the green flag drops. Well, Mike, really and truthfully, when you don't have any caution flag, uh, it doesn't really matter. You know, the car gets strung out. The guy that's got his chassis working better, or, you know, the car handling better or what. It doesn't matter if you start 16th or 19th or 20th. You know, it, it's just a matter of time you can beat the front. A couple of raindrops up here on the glass of the booth. Trouble there is Waltrip's car caroming off the wall. And Bobby Hillen's car has slid to the bottom of the racetrack. He is in the wall as well. No smoke. No indication of a blown engine. They'll race back to the caution. There is Hillen's car. And rain is beginning to come down a little bit harder now. See what happened here. I don't really understand that, Mike. You know, the way the car went up, almost like something broke or something. It could have been wet right there, but nobody else took that bad. And look what happened to Bobby Hillen's car. I believe he clipped somebody, Mike. I don't believe that car would have turned that fast yet. Let's see if our on-track reporter, Dick Brooks, in the number 90 Chameleon Ford, had a good angle on it from his seat. Dick Brooks down the racetrack again. We, uh, everybody kind of took off after the caution flag, and there's all bunched up. stuff. Everybody kind of jumping for, for position. And I don't know for sure what happened to Walter. Just all of a sudden, uh, there was a lot of debris on the track, and uh, and a couple of cars with the marks out from under him. And uh, he had been in a wall. So uh, 
I didn't see what happened to it, but uh, he hit the wall up at swing one and two somewhere and knocked the right front off. This is Dick Brooks, World 600 from Maslow Sports Network. You saw Waltrip walking past. He is okay. So is Bobby Hillis as the crowd seeks shelter from the rain showers. Let's see who else is singing in the rain. Dick Brooks on a racetrack for Maslow Sports Network. Charlotte Motor Speedway at World 600. We got some rain, folks. And it's coming down hard over here on the back street. I feel like a duck running along through here with my feathers wet. I don't believe we're going to get this thing restarted for a while. I don't know what they're going to do. They're going to sit and wait, I guess. I just got a call from uh, from the Weather Bureau who said that there's a lot of storms coming in here. So uh, we're going to sit and wait this out just a little bit. Take one out. World 600. Midland Sports Network. Coming in sight glass. Sport number 90. I think it must be wet in there up to his neck. I'll tell you what, Mike, I believe he's got a whole script book with him. As the fans seek shelter from what we hope will be a brief rain shower, we've learned that Darrell Waltrip ran over a piece of exhaust pipe that fell off the car directly in front of him. That triggered the chain reaction crash. They pulled the cars down to the track apron and covered them up under the red flag period. And hopefully we'll get back to racing before too long. It's a good time to take a break. We'll be right back to the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Mike Joy with Donnie Allison and Charlie Harville. Bobby Allison's the leader. He and Cale Yarborough and Dale Earnhardt, the three cars on the lead lap as they face the green flag of starter Harold Kinder. Those cars in the lead lap are in the outside lane. Bobby Allison's at the head of the pack, and he leads them down to the green flag. Here comes Yarborough and Earnhardt right away, and everybody's getting away from Allison. He's sliding right back through the field. Well, I think something's happened to his car, Mike. Either it's fouled a plug or, or something's wrong. I never like to restart a race after the red, just for that reason. Allison has backslid to seventh in the running order. He's still third in the race with only three cars on the lead lap. Earnhardt, car number three is the leader. The five car of Jeff Bodine, one lap down. He's fighting to get back on the lead lap, which Harry Gant has just done. Gant leads the parade. But Earnhardt in the blue and yellow number three car is the race leader. Cale Yarborough in 28. The second place car. Allison in third. Everyone else a lap down. And as at the start of the race, Harry Gant has jumped out in front. But he is just a couple of car lengths shy of being a lap down. And there comes Bobby back now, Mike. I don't know. Like I said, I believe he had a foul plug or something because the car wouldn't run at all on the, on the restart. Now it seems to be doing well again. Allison has just moved in front of Jeff Bodine. He is fifth in the running order, third in the race. Earnhardt wants to put Gant a lap down, and he does so. Makes it look easy down to the first turn. There's Yarborough. He is filling the rearview mirror of Dale Earnhardt. Harry Gant up on the outside. Mike, I definitely think the racetrack's better right now than it was before before the red flag. You know, I think it's washed clean because the cars seem to be sticking quite a bit better. And, uh, well, they're all right back there racing again like they were at the very start of the race. And, and uh, the racetrack's just got to be better right now. Dale Earnhardt leads the field out of the corner. Rod Bouchard's car slides up high, the right side of your screen. Allison, 22, and there's the race for the lead. Yarborough wants it, and the 81st victory of his career. Ooh, and they almost touch. I'll tell you, they get awful close right there. Well, well Earnhardt all day long, even though when the racetrack was slick before the rains and everything like that, he's really on the outside of somebody. He was doing lap after lap after lap. He's just a hard charging driver. The orange and white Hardy machine of Yarborough has the inside. Dale Earnhardt in the blue and yellow Richard Childress prepared Wrangler car, the high side. Yarborough takes the lead. He has never won the World 600. Bobby Allison and Ron Bouchard move under Harry Gant. Gant now a lap down. He and Bouchard are fighting now for the fourth spot. Cale Yarborough, that orange and white Waddell Wilson prepared machine. They qualified over two days here at Charlotte. The first day, 15 cars took time, and the rest of the session got rained out. Cale was the fastest of those 15, but it didn't hold up. Harry Gann ended up on the pole. He qualified on the second day. But Yarborough has come through the field from 14th starting spot. 
Mike, it wasn't really a true indication of qualifying on account of the first day. The track was a lot slower than it was the second morning. Here's Charlie Harville. I'm in the pit with Waddell Wilson, crew chief of Kale Aldo, number 28, Harding Park. Are you set to go the distance now, Waddell? Yes, we can make it the rest of the way. Everything looks good right now. We've got enough fuel, and the tires are good also. Change four tires last time. a caution out, then we'll stop and put on four tires. Waddell Wilson has been the engine builder for this team since it was formed in 1978. And does he have a bunch of super speedway pulls to his credit? I'll guarantee he does, Mike. Uh, he's just almost unbeatable at Daytona and Talladega. Here is Phil Parsons, the rookie challenger, coming back out to try to complete some laps and pile up some rookie points. That Rookie of the Year honor, a prestigious one. You won it in 1967. You were Indie Rookie of the Year in 1970. And that's got to mean a lot to a driver on the way up in his career. Well, it does, Mike. Uh, it really meant a lot to me uh, back there when I won it. But it means a lot more now because it pays a lot more money than it did back when I won it. And uh, But it is it's really a, a great thing to win. Everything pays a lot more money now. Today's winner will probably take home about $60,000, $70,000. Yeah, in uh, 1970, I won the race here. And finished fourth at Indian the same weekend and only made $70,000 in those races. Cale Yarborough. His one concern is winning his first World 600. Dale Earnhardt, middle of your screen, the second place car. Bobby Allison to the right, his third. There's a great seesaw battle going on between Yarborough and Allison. Right now, they are both tied with 80 career NASCAR feature wins. younger, Earnhardt, is 32. He's won nine times on NASCAR's premier circuit. Dale slips a little bit up high, and that'll give Bobby some room. Well, yeah, and you know, like I said earlier, Bobby's car is definitely stuck in the bottom of the racetrack, and for Kale to win his first World 600, he's got to work it out for him, because Bobby Allison will stay right there with him. There's Allison under Earnhardt, taking second spot. A moment ago, you saw Darrell Waltrip's car being worked on in the garage area, trying to get him back on the track and pile up some Winston Cup points. He's the point-standing leader, trying to win his third championship. Only one driver in the history of this sport has won three titles consecutively. That's Cale Yarborough. Well, you know, right now, Mike, that all three of the current leaders in the points are having trouble. Uh, Terry Labonte, Darrell Waltrip, and Ricky Rudd. Ricky hadn't had his trouble in, in wrecking and so on, but his car's not doing well at all. Rudd is way off the pace. He is posted four laps down. You have drivers in this sport winning races in their 20s, Tim Richmond, Ricky Rudd, but the stars of auto racing are older. In their 30s, Earnhardt, Bonnet, Waltrip, Bouchard, and Bodine, and in their 40s, well, the guys that are right at the front of the field here. Right, and, uh, you know, the, the older of the two in the front of the field is catching up mighty fast right now. Bobby is, is definitely catching right up to Cale. Bobby Allison, 46 years old, the defending Winston Cup stock car champion, and he has Yarborough right alongside as they come off the fourth corner into the trioval area. Side by side. Ooh. That way, he touched a little bit right there, Mike, I believe. You couldn't put a piece of paper between them. And Kale will get a jump off the corner. A lead of half a car length, but not for long. Allison right there. One car behind them. Looks like Lake Speed trying to catch a bit of draft. Yeah, that's some um, racing uh, coming down to the end of 600 miles and still racing that hard side by side. Allison is on the low side in 22. Yarborough in 28. And they are racing closer together than most people park. Yarborough keeping Allison down low, and smoke begins to pour from his car. Lots of it. I think Mike really right there what happened. They must have broke the pistol stuff, and you don't very often see that from that race scene. Very seldom that you lose an engine. But that's water coming out the exhaust pipe right there. Kale Yarborough will coast around to the garage area and out of the race. We'll be right back. Dale Earnhardt lined up for the restart. Harold Kinder drops the green flag, and we're back to racing at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Buddy Baker is the car out in front of the leader. He is trying to get within striking distance, but he's now just three laps down. 
Bobby Allison in 22 is ahead of the field. Right behind him is Harry Gant. Gant in the 33 car, one lap down. That gives Allison a bit of a cushion on that yellow nose machine. Way up high, running through the speedy dry, the cleanup for Cale Yarborough's engine. There's Earnhardt flashing at the bottom of your screen. Allison will put another lap on Baker. The right front of his car blunted just a bit by some earlier contact. Gant is right there. He is a lap away from the leader. And behind them, Earnhardt. Bobby's car looks to be working a lot better than it was before the rain delay. It, I believe it is, uh, Mike, but, you know, right now, uh, Harry Gant is definitely trying to get back in the lead lap. If, if they were to get a caution, he'd have an opportunity to race Bobby at the end or, or uh, Dale Earnhardt because uh, under NASCAR rules, the guys in the lead lap can move up and double up on the outside. So if Gant could pass Allison and the caution flag come out, he could come all the way around the racetrack and be in a position to challenge the leader. Plus, come right up to Bobby on the restart. So Gant, hoping to get by the leader and back on the lead lap. Meanwhile, Earnhardt has a pack of traffic to contend with. And it looks like that Earnhardt might have fell off the face a little bit. You know, I don't know whether he's got something wrong with his car or just not handling as well or what, but he's definitely slowed down a little bit. When the cars made that last pit stop under caution, if they made an adjustment to Earnhardt's car or even if they just put on a set of tires, with different circumference than the ones he had on the car, it could really throw things out of whack for him. I think so. It might have changed the rollout of that difference in the circumference of the tires, and it's all important. You know, it, uh, they get one tire a little bit too big or a little bit too little, and it makes the car not handle as well, and uh, that's what I think is happening to Dale Earnhardt's car right now. There is Earnhardt, the number three blue and yellow Wrangler machine. Richard Childress, the former driver, the car owner, Kirk Schelmerty and the crew chief. They're running in second place. Behind this man, Bobby Allison. The Gary Nelson directed Die Guard crew. Miller High Life entry. The defending national champion. That building in the upper right of the screen, condominium. Just part of a multi-million dollar expansion program at Charlotte Motor Speedway. New VIP suite, more grandstand, more facilities for the fans. You been up in those condos? Yes, uh, my brother Bobby owns one and uh, I had the pleasure of being up there trying to help him get moved in for this race. But I hope, really and truthfully, along with all the other uh, improvements, that they put something beside the steel that they put on the racetrack next time. <laughs> there is Bobby Allison. Forget the condominium. He's got the best seat in the house right now. The seat of the lead race car. Dale Earnhardt, the second place car. Trying to close in, but Earnhardt is not running as low on the racetrack. There's Allison almost right down on the apron. Earnhardt's car is a little higher up on the racetrack, indicative that he's not handling quite as well as Bobby. He's definitely not handling as well as Bobby right now, Mike, and uh, he has slowed down. Bobby's got a pretty comfortable lead, and I'm sure that right now Bobby's main concern is just finish these laps out. Bobby Allison has won this race twice. 1977 and 1981 as part of his 80 career victories. If he wins here today, he could go over $5 million in career earnings on the NASCAR circuit. And that sounds like a lot of money, Mike, but I'll guarantee you, he wish he could put his hand on every bit of it right now. Those monies paid to the car owner. The driver, of course, gets the share. And Allison, who races not only 30 Winston Cup events, but a total of about 80 races a year, flies to most of them in his own plane and tinkers with aircraft and automotive inventions when he's not behind the wheel of a race car. Your brother is a busy guy. Yeah, he likes to stay that way, Mike, you know, and uh, yeah, like I said, he's the oldest one out there right now, I think, and uh, I don't know anybody that's older than him on the racetrack right now, but he does stay very busy. Well, it's ironic that perhaps the oldest driver on the racetrack has one of the youngest crew chiefs in the business. Gary Nelson is just 31. Yeah, and the boy came from California. The young man came from California. He's extremely good with the race car. And best of all, he's good with Bobby Allison. And Nelson is an innovative crew chief. They use a computer on pit road and program the past World 600s into that computer to try to develop trends for what to expect in this race. And obviously, they have planned well. 
because there is the white flag from starter Harold Kinder. And next trip by, Bobby Allison will pocket the lion's share of the half million dollar purse for this silver anniversary World 600. Yes, and I'll tell you, that, that's a long laugh, but I'll guarantee he's smiling right now. And he'll be another one of the drivers who said he won this race three times. He laps by second generation driver Randy Baker. Up in turn three and four, the Miller High Life Buick comes off the fourth corner, addresses itself to the starting line, and there's the checkered flag, Bobby Allison. Joins Buddy Baker and David Pearson as the only three-time winners of the World 600. So Richard Petty does not win his 200th career victory today. Neil Bonnet does not win his third straight World 600. Bobby Allison will be going to victory lane. Well, you know, Mike, it's, it's a shame in a way. Uh, Kelly Yarver really made a valiant effort to uh, win his first 600, and the engine blew up, and it cost him the chance of doing that. But I'm sure that Bobby Allison, and Bobby ran a good race all day. He ran good and strong all day. I mean, it wasn't a gift to him. He deserved it. We'll visit with him in victory lane right after this. Prettiest victory lane in motorsports, and he's picked up a hitchhiker. Yeah, that happened to be his lovely wife, Judy, and I saw my dad just as the car came in there, standing there to congratulate Bobby. So it's a real family occasion as Bobby Allison is in victory lane for the silver anniversary World 600, outlasting Cale Yarborough and dueling Dale Earnhardt to the finish. Doing the Durant Bouchard finished third, Harry Gant was fourth, Jeff Bodine was fifth, Lake Speed, Buddy Baker, Jody Ridley, David Pearson, and Tim Richmond round out the top ten. Let's go to Charlie Harville in victory lane. Well, there's a really tough part of the race. It appeared to be at the end. Did you run hard all day? We ran hard all day. We got behind a little bit uh, there in that one stretch. Uh, we were experimenting with our tires a little bit, but we had reeled them in before, and we felt we could do it again, so uh, everything went okay. Because you have beaten Kale, or do you stay in? Yeah, we had him beat when he blew up. Any, near, any narrow escape during the day? Any close call for you? About 18 or 20. <laughs> just every time. Track stage slick all day, and it was just something else. You're the Miss Lou champion. Your fourth win on Miss Lou, Bobby. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll take it. Yes, Robert. Yes, Michael. Okay, okay. okay. let's do this quick. Robert. Well, Mike, it's raining like the Dickens down in victory lane right now, but Bobby sure isn't minding it. For Donnie Allison and Charlie Harville, this is Mike Joy congratulating Bobby Allison on his World 600 victory. Ms. Luke Crew.